As a believer, one of the, one, one of the main things that should occupy your life is to get control over your sin. Uh, you need to reduce it, defeat it. It is the constant concern of the child of God. It is the constant concern of the Christian. And see, God has made us a new creation, and we've been talking about this for weeks, that he's made us a new creation, he's given us a new life, uh, he's given us a new purpose in life, he's put us within a new family, the church. We have Christian brothers and sisters He's given us a new perspective. Now we have a godly perspective on the world, not the old ungodly perspective that we had before. Uh, we have new values. And, and because of all that, God commands us in the strength of the Holy Spirit to subdue our unredeemed humanness, to bring it under control. So God wants us to live a holy, pure godly life. I think that's clear for most Christians, that that is what God wants. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 14 says, as obedient children do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. So don't conform to them that you used to have, that you had before. Don't conform to them. He says, but just as he who called you, thank you, is holy, look at that, this is anticipation, right? What? <laughs> but, he, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. So God expects us to cultivate a lifestyle of practical holiness. Now Paul understood this very well. And it was his constant concern that he cultivated that one in his life, practical holiness. And he wanted to get control over the sin in his life. He wrote this in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9. He said, I discipline my body and I make it my slave. So I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. See, the Apostle Paul understood that living a sinful life would disqualify him from his ministry. You know, a lot of preachers need to understand that. Once you commit some horrible sin in your life, you're no longer qualified to pastor a church or lead people. And Paul understood that, so he says, I discipline my body and I make it my slave. So that after I've preached to others, I won't be disqualified. He, he didn't want to be unfit to preach Christ and the Christian responsibilities. So he disciplined himself. He lived a holy life. He denied himself. Guys, living a sinful life, this is on your outline, living a sinful life, an undisciplined life, makes us unfit to witness for Christ. Now that doesn't mean you're unsaved. It's just you're unfit. Nobody takes an ungodly person serious when they're trying to tell you about a godly God. Nobody takes that serious. You have to live for the Lord, and it disqualifies you. Now, you don't get control over your sin so you can be saved. That's not why you get control over your sin. Uh, your eternal life is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So you, you can't earn heaven. You don't deserve heaven. So we're not talking about getting control of your sin so you can go to heaven. You live your life on mission. On a mission to subdue sin, your old self, because you are already going to heaven. It's because... You do this because you are a child of God, a holy God. That's why you subdue the sin. That's why you try to get control over it in your life. You do it because you're a child of God. You do that because you've been bought with a, a price, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, do, you try not to live a sinful life anymore because you're going to heaven. Not so you can go to heaven. 
Now, in this life, and I want to be clear about this, in, in this life, you're never going to be sinless. You're never going to be perfect. That's not going to happen. But you can reduce it in your life. And it ought to be the constant occupation of your life doing that. Reducing the sin in your life. It ought to be something you think about, you pray about, you work on. You know, the Bible says to work out your own salvation. Not work for your salvation, but you are to live like Christ. The Apostle Paul has also told us, he's already told us if we've looked at Ephesians, to lay aside our old self and to put on the new self. So now we get to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30, 25 and he gets specific. He gets practical here in these verses. And he starts to lay out what holiness looks like, what, what purity looks like, what godliness looks like. And one of the great things about the Word of God is God is clear on how we're supposed to live. There's, there's no question. We don't have to wonder, well, what does God want us to do? How does God want us to act? It's perfectly clear, written in the Word of God. So to do anything different than that is just simply ignoring God, rebelling against God. Here in this passage, he gives us five things that are practical holiness. Now, this word practical, you know what that means. It means you stop talking about it and you actually do it. That's what practical is. You stop talking about being a Christian. You stop talking about, hey, I want to live for God. And then you actually start doing it. And there's a big difference, right? Uh, we talked about Wednesday night in our Bible study how talk is cheap. Matter of fact, it's worthless when it comes to when you're talking about how you're going to serve God. Action is the only thing that matters. What you do is the only thing that has meaning. And here he is saying that you need to stop talking about something and you need to start doing it so you need to stop talking about hey i'm going to be a godly husband and start being one you need to stop talking about hey i want to be a godly wife and be a helper to my husband stop talking about that and actually do it some some young people say i want to i want to live for the lord okay do it do it. This is, what, this is what he's going to tell us how to do it. He's going to give us some practical, specific advice. I want to be a good parent. I want to be a godly parent. Okay. Do it. Stop talking about it. I want to be a, a godly church member. Great. Let's do it. That's what he's talking about here. Living with practical Holiness, practical holiness. You stop talking about it. Now, what does that look like? And again, I want to remind you that the Apostle Paul is talking to a church. He's writing this letter to Ephesus. It's a group of Christians. They took this letter and they spread it to other churches in the area that had been started. So it was kind of a circular letter. It went around to different churches. But he's talking about the church. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to the family of God and he's telling this family, these Christians, this is the way you're supposed to live. This is the way you're supposed to act. This is the way you're supposed to behave. And he gives us five things here in these verses, beginning in Ephesians 4, 25. The first thing is, this is on your outline, you always speak the truth. That's the first thing that he tells us. Practical holiness. If you're going to be a holy person, if you're going to be a godly person, a person that lives for the Lord, you always speak the truth. The Bible says, therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. So he's talking about the people within your life, in your Christian life. Speak truth with your neighbor. He's not, he's not meaning your next door neighbor in your community. Now, you should speak truth, right? 
to them. But that's not, the context here is he's really, it's church life. It's Christianity. And he says, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. And then he says, he defines it, what neighbor is, for we are members of one another. So he's talking about our church family, Christians. Now, guys, I don't have to tell you that a person who continually lies as a part of life on his daily life is revealing himself not to be a child of God, but a child of Satan. You get around somebody that they're always lying. They're always kind of uh, hedging the truth or, or, or telling white lies and, and never really just giving it like saying the truth like it is. You get around somebody like that, they're not revealing that they're a child of God. They're re actually revealing that they're a child of Satan. The Bible says this. It's very clear in John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus is talking to people, okay, men. And he says this, you are of your father, the devil. See, Satan has children. They're liars is what they are. You're of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. They wanted to kill Jesus. And does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. You know, the devil can't help but lie. You know why? Because that's his nature. You can't do anything contrary to your nature. Do you know that? So if you're lost, you're going to act like a lost person. If you're a Christian, now you have the ability, if you're a saved person, now you have the ability to act like a saved person. But Satan is a liar, and anybody who lies, I'm telling you, this is a good way of knowing if you're hanging around a Christian. If this person is legitimately a child of God. If they tell the truth, that's the way to do it. This term, lay aside, he uses there, therefore laying aside all falsehood. This is the same idea of laying aside a garment. Uh, you know, in those days in, the, in, the, in Israel, the people wore a cloak. You know, they had an outer garment that they would wear. And any time they were getting ready to do some work, that would take some energy or they needed freedom to move their arms and, you know, their body, they would take that cloak off. And that would give them freedom to do uh, what they needed to do. So he's saying lay that aside. One example of this is kind of a negative example, but when you remember in Acts, I think it was chapter 7, when the people were stoning Stephen to death. You remember that? They were killing him because he had told them about Jesus and they didn't want to hear it, so they stoned him to death. And the Bible says that the people took their cloaks off, their outer garments, and laid it at the feet of Saul. Why'd they do that? Why'd they take their cloak off? So they'd have freedom to do their evil work. That's why they did it. And God here, Apostle Paul, he's writing to us and he tells us to lay aside falsehood. Why? So we could have the freedom to do God's work. You can't do God's work if you're a liar. You can't do God's work if you have falsehood in your life. That's the devil's work. That's not God's work. Every word that comes out of the mouth of a Christian should be true. Every word that comes out of your mouth ought to be true. Now, I'm not saying there's times where we just don't know something. We say something out of ignorance. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you deliberately lying to somebody. Deliberately uh, saying something that's not true. Everything that comes out of the mouth of a Christian should be true. He says, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. See, we're connected to each other, just like uh, the physical body, you know, the body parts are connected physically. Guess what? We're connected spiritually. It's a really a, a much deeper connection, a more important connection. Because the work that we're involved in is the most important work on the planet. It's spiritual work for God. 
So we're supposed to tell each other the truth. We're connected to one another. Guys, if I can't trust my Christian brother and sister when they tell me something, who can I trust? Who can I trust? If I can't trust the people within my own church family, and how are we going to serve God in a godly, pure manner if we're a group of people that are lying to one another? Or anybody, for that matter, lying, period. There has to be complete 100% truth. Now, <clears throat> let me just say this. Telling the truth does not mean you have to say everything that you know and everything that you think. Okay? You and I know a lot of things, and we think a lot of things, and they're true. They are true. Doesn't mean we have to say them. Doesn't mean we have to say them. That's not lying. You know, some people think, oh, you know, I know this in my brain, so I'm supposed to say it, otherwise I'm being dishonest or lying. No, you're not. You could be being smart. You could, you, that actually could be wisdom that you're doing. Telling the truth does not mean that you have to say every single thing that you know and every single thing that you think. Matter of fact, sometimes we have to keep confidence with people, right? And truthfulness and keeping confidence are not contrary to one another. The key thing is, is if I do say it, if I do say it, it better be true. Whatever I say should be true. There shouldn't be any exaggerations. Okay? I got a fish this big, and really it was this big. That's an exaggeration. That's a lie. That's not the truth. There should be no exaggerations. There should not be half-truths. There should not be misleading information. No white lies. There's no such thing as a white lie. It's a lie. I mean, I take this so far to where my wife is, can't ever, she's difficult for her to give me a surprise birthday party. And I tell her, you know, I don't care if you do it, but you better not ever tell me one line while you're doing it. You know, like, uh, we're going to go here and do this, but really we're going to go here and do that. That's a lie. Don't do that. <clears throat> Y'all probably think I'm being too strict, right? But Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you're telling the truth here, aren't you, to me? <clears throat> All right, so we, we always speak the truth. The second thing is, is you only have righteous anger. This is what Paul talks about here. He says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not grieve or, and do not give the devil an opportunity. So guys, there's two kinds of anger that really in, in the world, there's two kinds of anger. And it is not a sin to be angry as long as you're angry about the right things and you're not angry too long. That's what he's saying here. So it's a Hebrew idiom where it gives you permission to do something, but then it puts parameters on it. So a Christian is going to get angry from time to time. A Christian's going to get angry about sin. A Christian's going to get angry when they see God and his word and his son Jesus disrespected, a Christian's going to get angry about that. That's why it's hard to write, watch comedians you know, really anywhere these days. I've tried in the past. You watch a comedian and automatically they're making fun of God and Jesus and, and I get mad. So a Christian's going to get angry about those kind of things, sin and, and when people disrespect God. Guys, there is within Christianity righteous, something called righteous indignation. Anger at evil, 
and hard-heartedness of sinners. You can get angry about that. Now, Jesus, he was um, healing a man on the Sabbath, you know, back in those days. Uh, the Pharisees had taught people that you couldn't even heal anybody on the Sabbath. You, you couldn't even help anybody, you know, on the Sabbath. Do some, you couldn't do something good because that'd be working and that's sin. That's what they taught. It wasn't true. They were not teaching the truth, but they taught it to control people. Well, Jesus was healing a man on the Sabbath one day, and these evil people, they were watching him do it. You know, they were, they were going to criticize him for it. In Mark chapter 3, verse 4, it says Jesus is looking around at them. So they're watching him. Well, he's looking at them too. You've got to remember that. God's always looking. Jesus is looking. He's looking around at them. And how was he looking at them? with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Now guys, have you ever felt that way where you saw things that were going on that were wrong and sinful and ungodly and disrespectful to God and the, and the Lord that you love and you kind of get this feeling inside of you? That happens to Christians. And, and, and it's, it's like anger when you see people that are being cruel are people who are being unfair and there's injustice going on. And then you see the wickedness of the world. I mean, there's so much around us these days of ungodliness, it's kind of difficult for a Christian not to be angry all the time. And that's why the Lord tells us. See, Christians, we can get angry. We can have righteous indignation. As long as anger about the right things. But a Christian is not permitted by God to stay angry. You don't have that freedom. You don't have that freedom. Look what he says here. He tells us how long we can stay angry. He says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. So before you go to bed at night, no matter what happened to you, you need to calm down before you go to bed at night. You've been angry, you've been upset, there's been injustice, there's been cruelty, there's been difficulty. And I'm not going to say exactly he literally means, you know, you only have one day to be angry, but that is what it says. That's what it says. Before the sun goes down on your anger. You got to calm down. You basically got to kind of step back and look at the situation in the scheme of the whole universe and all of time. You can't dwell on it. You may even have to forgive. What do you think about that? You may even have to forgive somebody. Uh, have compassion. You know, they're a sinner. Well, so are you. Um, you've received grace from God. Maybe that they haven't, but you, you have, and you ought to be thankful for that and compassionate. But it's okay for you to get mad and angry, but you can't let that Anger go down with the sun. Or you can't let the sun go down on your anger. You know, Rachel and I, we, we don't really argue that much anymore. Any, anymore. I mean, we've been married long enough to where she's pretty much whipped me into shape. And, and uh, I am the man that she wants me to be almost. Uh, so, you know, she's conformed me to the image that I'm supposed to be in. But in the early days when she was still working on that, um, we would argue from time to time in our early days. Uh, you know, by the way, I didn't know this, but, you know, it's a sin to throw your clothes beside the laundry hamper. I mean, you're supposed to put it in it. You're supposed to put the clothes in it. That's a sin. 
And I told Rachel, uh, another sin is the toilet paper. You know, the paper is supposed to be hanging out on the outside, not up, not by the wall. I mean, that's clearly a sin. So we would, we would fight about that stuff. We would fight about that stuff, and we would get into some knockdown drag. This is, I, maybe, I don't know if the kids heard it or not, but we'd shut the door and, you know, and... <clears throat> And we would fight and fight and fight. But you know what? We wouldn't go to, we would not. <laughs> clearly, clearly I lost. But uh, she could put that toilet paper any way she wants. But, but we would fight and fight and fight. But we would try not to go to bed mad at each other. I can't say we were successful with that all the time. But. But we would try not to, and sometimes we would just have to stay up all night and fight, you know, not even go to bed. Because God doesn't want us to stay angry for a long time. We're not allowed to do that. He doesn't give us permission to do that. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And here's why. And do not give the devil an opportunity. See, the devil will take the anger that's in the heart of a Christian and here you are, you love God, you love Jesus, you're on your way to heaven, you care about obeying him, but yet that anger gets in you because of uh, something that is wrong being done, and you get anger, and God, what happens is the devil will take that anger that you have, and he'll pour fuel on it, he'll fan the flame, he'll, uh, he'll get you to, to where you're so angry, now you want to get revenge. And you have vengeance in your eyes. And you start to become bitter. And, and, and selfishness. Just as, I mean, everything is about you. And you want self-satisfaction to get that person. By the way, there's a lot of that kind of anger being displayed in our country. Particularly over the last couple of years. I mean, you're angry about things that you ought to be angry about. But you don't want to take it so far to where you start doing things that are unchristian. And that's why he says you don't have permission to be angry very long. You can be angry about the right things, but you can't be angry even about them very long. It's got to be for a short time. Once anger takes you down that negative road of vengeance, you're no longer a blessing to the world. You're certainly no longer a blessing to your church. You're certainly no longer a blessing to your family and the people that are around you. So, the only anger that you can have is righteous anger. That's the only anger you can have is righteous anger. Anger about the right things, and you can't even have that very long. You shouldn't be angry. There's two kinds of anger. You can have righteous anger. That's it. You're not allowed to be angry about other things that does not offend God. It's not a sin Anger. You know, I almost died this morning. I wasn't going to tell you all this, but I was driving um, on Chiquita, and some, I was green light. I'm driving, you know, the speed limit, maybe a couple of miles faster. And a person pulled out in front of me. I mean, almost at right, almost right when I was in the intersection, I was approaching. I had to hit my brakes very hard. And everything in my car went flying forward. And the person, I mean, literally, I, the guy had green eyes. You know, I could, that's how close I was to him. What? <laughs> and I thought to myself, wow, I almost died. And then I said, but I didn't. And, you know, and I had a choice right then to just start, you know, be mad, be angry, be afraid, all that. And I just, 
just let it all go. I don't even care. I really just don't care. I live through it. You know, my kids, they jokingly say something to me if we're, if, uh, we're talking about something difficult that happened. They'll say, but did you die? <laughs> no. Okay, well, it's no big deal. You know, so many people get angry about a lot of things in the world. And it's just not worth it. And God doesn't want us to. So we always speak the truth. We only have righteous anger. Number three, you work so, I really should say so that, but you work so, what is the next words, guys? So you share, you can share. Now, guys, that's biblical. That's biblical. Let's look at this. It says, and he who steals must steal no longer. So a lot of Christians, you know, when they're, before they're, a lot of people before they're saved, they, they're thieves. And they, I'm not saying like they're, they break into people's houses and, you know, rob banks and things like that, but, but they are thieves. The old self has a built-in inclination to steal. Young children do it. They'll take people's toys. Uh, a little bit older kids, they think it's funny when they can steal something and get something for nothing from somebody else. Uh, addicts, drug addicts and alcoholics, they steal for their, so they can afford their, their addiction. Adults steal in many ways in order to get ahead in life. They think, well, if I could save this 500 or 600 in my taxes or or uh, charge somebody too much money when I'm selling them, but they're too ignorant to know when I'm selling them something that they don't know, that I'm ripping them off. That's stealing. People do it to get ahead. Uh, businesses steal in order to make a profit. And Paul says Christians who steal must steal no longer. They're no longer supposed to steal. He says, but rather he must labor. So you stop stealing. You stop taking anything that's not yours ever. And you know, what do you do with a paper clip at work? You know, can you take a paper clip from work, Richie? Uh, Richie says yes, don't you? He's so gracious. If you really need it, if you really need it that's right. Uh, you know, and I'm not, I don't want to go down to that level, but I'm just saying that people steal from work more than just a paperclip. Steal time, that's right. So it's stealing, guys. Let's call it what it is. Stop stealing. He says, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good. So, so God, he... He says we must labor. In other words, we got to work. You know, the curse for man is that we're to work to have the sweat of our brow. Life is not supposed to be easy for us, guys. We are supposed to work. And by the way, it's not 40 hours a week or six or, or, or five days a week. It's six days a week, right? All the time we're supposed to work. We got one day to rest. One day. God puts parameters on the very job that we're supposed to have. He says that we're only supposed to perform with our own hands what is good. What is good. So it has to be what's good. Look, you should never, through your job, you should never have to compromise God's standards or do anything that dishonors Him or misleads or harms others in any way. None of that's good. So you can't do it. You can't compromise God's standard. You can't do anything that dishonors him. You should not mislead someone through your work. And you certainly shouldn't harm them in any way. And why does God want you to work? He tells us here, so that he will have something to share with one who has 
need. That's a complete change of life, by the way. When you get saved, see, before you're saved, you work for yourself. That's what you do. You work for yourself. Before you're a child of God, before you've given, been given the new life in Christ, before you're born again, all of your work and all of your money is for you. And nobody better not try to take it or even say you're doing something wrong. It's all about you. Of course. But once you're saved, that changes. I mean, there's a radical difference in the born-again believer. Radical. And he says here, now, God says, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. It's a different way of thinking. Now, there's two things I want to say real quickly about this. First of all, it is God's will that everyone who is able should work and provide for their own needs. It's God's will. Look, if you can get up in the morning and walk down to the corner and beg, you can get up and walk to McDonald's and ask for, beg them for a job. If you have the physical capability to work, you're supposed to work. Is it, that, that's what the Bible teaches, guys. It's only people who can't work. They cannot, there is no way they can work. Those people should be taken care of. Those people should be taken care of. Look what the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 3.10. Paul's writing, he says, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. So Paul's ordering them something. He says, if anyone is not willing to work, and we know that Paul meant they couldn't work. I mean, these are people that could work, but they're not willing to. Uh, then he is not to eat either. Do you get that? You have a perfectly healthy person begging for money so he can buy food. <laughs> you know, you, if you need your lawn mowed, maybe take them to your house and have them mow your lawn. And then maybe give them some food. But they, we shouldn't be giving out money to people who are physically able to work. But they don't work. He is not... He clearly says here, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. That's a, do you get that point? It's clear. Get up off your lazy boy chair and go to work. Okay, verse 11, for we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life. By the way, any person who is able to work and they're not working is an undisciplined person. And that's the reason why they're in the shape they're in. They need to discipline themselves. He says that they're undisciplined life, doing no work at all. And here's what they are doing, but acting like busybodies. They're going around uh, dealing with, you know, getting in other people's business. They've got too much time on their hands. So it's God's will that everyone who is able, and again, if they're not able, I think we should definitely help them, right? That's what he says here. That's what he says here. Able should work and provide for their own needs. But second, it is God's will that your work, now let's get personal here. Let me get, let me get personal with you guys. Your work, your work, your money. He says, I believe that it is God's will that your work should be for the specific purpose to help people in need. So the Christian's desire, I think this is on your outline, to earn more money, to earn more, should be for the purpose of being able to give more. And help more. 
That's the, that's the reason why the child of God has a desire to make more money is so they can give more, share more, help more. Now, guys, I don't have to say this to you. You know it. That's not what's been going on in Christianity for a long time. The idea of making more money, we want to do what lost people do. Use it for ourselves. And don't you dare tell me that's wrong. That's what people, that's the thought that they have. It's my money. I can do what I want to with it. Paul says, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that, for the purpose of, so that he will have something to share with one who has needs. So after you've taken care of your needs, because you do need to take care of your needs, and if you have a family, you ought to take care of your family's needs. But after that's done, a Christian's additional gains should be for the purpose of giving and sharing and helping people who are in need. So you work so you can share. Now, you know, we're about to go into a recession, I'm hearing. Have y'all heard that? Everybody's talking about the big recession. And everybody's talking about how Prices are going to go high, and, and oh, uh, you know, there's not going to be any water. I think somebody told me it was going to stop raining. It, 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 I mean, it's going to get bad is what I'm hearing, all right? I don't know if it is or not, but it might, and there are signs to it. Right, we've been, we've, we've been through it before, and it, it's, it's cyclical, hopefully, Um. But guys, I just want to say this. When it, when, if that happens, we need to keep our eyes and ears open to the, the people in our church that are, that are working. You know, we know they're not lazy people. We know they're not undisciplined. They're working. And if, if they just can't earn enough money to take care of needs that they have, or maybe they can't work because of physical problems, and they just cannot earn enough money, to take care of their needs. I'm not saying their greeds. We're not going to buy them a cell phone. You know, we're not going to buy them a Maserati. But we need to be sensitive to their needs and take the money that we have, and even if we have to give something up. Isn't that horrible for me to say that? Even if you have to give something up, give it to those people who need. See, that's what church life is. That's what Christianity is. And I think that's what Paul is saying. This is practical holiness. Stop talking about being a Christian and actually start doing things that Christians do. Share. Number four. You only speak wholesome words. Wholesome words. He says, let no unwholesome so that's foul, rotten, corrupt. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. And the reason for that is because it's not within your character anyway. I mean, you're a new Christian. You're a, you're a new person. You have the new self. It's not your character. Unwholesome words should be as sickening to us as eating a spoiled piece of meat. Have you ever eaten a steak where somebody said it's been aged? Yeah, I ate one time, ate one like that one time. I think they aged it a little too long. They left that out on the back porch too long, I think. <clears throat> one time, ate one like that one time. I think they aged it a little too long. They left that out on... That was horrible to hear that, by the way. My, oh, my goodness. That's me. So we should not say, you know, unwholesome words. And David, he didn't want to say unwholesome words. In Psalm 141, verse 3, he says, Set a guard 
O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And the reason why he's praying this to God is because he knew that he didn't want to say anything unwholesome, but he knew that he does sometimes. So he needs God's help to stop him from doing it. So do we. So how should we speak? It says, but only such a word as is good for edification. And that means building up, advancing that person, uh, constructive, instructive, with the goal to help the person. It says, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So sometimes people need encouragement. They're going through a difficult time, a trial, and they need encouragement. So you want to provide that word for them. Sometimes people are having to make a difficult decision, and you might need to get a, give a word of wisdom from the Word of God to them and have wise words for them and instructive words. You know, sometimes people just need a firm rebuke. Now, this is the one thing that we don't like to do is the, the rebuke uh, because of an ungodly lifestyle. You know, we're considered mean if we do that, but I think that Confronting somebody with a loving rebuke in firmness, but loving, is the most gracious thing you can do for a person, really. I mean, I don't think it should be the first uh, way to do it. Maybe you should go to them with some tender talk at first. But if somebody keeps sinning against God, uh, I think the most gracious thing that you could do for them is to give them a, a rebuke. A firm one and call out their sin uh, and that is a word of grace that they need to hear for the moment the Bible says in Proverbs 25 12 like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold so he's talking about something valuable beautiful desirable it's an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise reprover, that's somebody who's rebuking you for something you're doing wrong, a reprover, to a listening ear. So the words of the wise repro reprover is a valuable thing, it's a beautiful thing, it's a wholesome thing to somebody who actually wants to listen to it. It's beautiful for them. Now, if somebody doesn't want to receive it, then that's not going to go well probably. Verse 30, Paul gives us the motivation of putting off this unwholesome talk. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So, by the way, you can't grieve somebody that doesn't love you. You know, if, if you don't love somebody and they do something stupid, you don't even care. Right? It doesn't bother you. Oh, you know. But if you love them, and they do something wrong, it grieves you. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 10, 1, a wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief to his mother. And why does his foolishness bring her grief? Because he loves, she loves him. And it hurts her. So guess what? God loves you. God loves you. And he loves you so much. Here's what he has done for you. He has eternally secured you. You cannot lose your salvation. What, I, what if I go out and get drunk and smoke pot and do some crazy things? You still can't lose your salvation. I mean, if you're doing that all the time, you're probably not saved anyway. But I could go out and do that tonight, and I wouldn't lose my salvation. Why? Because that's not what said. My works didn't save me. God saved me. And he has eternally secured me. And the way that he did that is he put the Holy Spirit of God in me. That's what he says here. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So when I was saved, the Holy Spirit of God came into me and indwells me now, and he's like this stamp. He's like a stamp that God has put on me to indicate me as one of God's children. And that stamp is permanent. 
And I am sealed to the day of redemption. That means the final day when I'm actually going to be with God in heaven. So Paul is asking in effect, how, can, how in the world can you do things that grieve the one who has secured your eternal life? How can you do, how can you live like that? How can you grieve your comforter and your helper and your teacher and the one who uh, resides within you? How can, how can you do that? And he says, don't do it. Don't have foul words, rotten words that grieve God. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. Now, does that mean that I can't even say some of the, the four-letter words that, you know, is pretty much acceptable in all of culture? Yes, that's what it means. That's what I believe it means. I mean, I know some people just throw these words out, these little four-letter words in between words. I mean, some, some people do it every other word. I'll be honest with you, I just think it shows their ignorance, their inability to communicate, and their lack of caring about saying wholesome things to people. And it shows the, the sinfulness and the impurity and the dirtiness of their heart. And Christians ought not say foul, rotten words. Ought not say them. Everything that comes out of your mouth ought to be wholesome. All right. So you always speak the truth. You only have righteous anger. You work so you can share. You only speak wholesome words. Number five, you live practicing holy virtues. A vice is a bad behavior. A virtue is a moral behavior. That's all you should ever practice. Moral behavior. You shouldn't have vices. Now we do, and none of us are perfect. We're a work in progress. But we shouldn't just sit back and say, well, I got these vices. You know, you're just going to have to accept that. I'm just going to have to live with it. No, don't ever give up like that. You live practicing holy virtues. He says, let all bitterness. Now, this bitterness comes from holding a grudge over somebody. That's where bitterness comes. And it causes someone, once you get bitter, because maybe something happened to you 10 years ago, and you're bitter, so you're still bitter about it. You're just a grumpy person, a sour person, even now, because you've let bitterness come into your life. So God says, let all bitterness and wrath, in other words, that wrath is that, that hot-headed rage that burst out in one moment. It's wrath. And clamor, or anger, he says. Anger is that, that smoldering negative emotion, that feeling that you have that really affects you in a multiple ways. You know, there's a lot of people that live with a lot of anger that's settled in their heart and their life. And, uh, you know, it kind of seeps out in all different kinds of areas of your life because you're angry. God says, don't, don't do that. Don't practice that. You need to practice holy virtues. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. Now, clamor, boy, you don't want to be around somebody who clamors. That is what you call a public outburst. Somebody who's lost their temper, they've lost control, they have no self-discipline at all, and they just blurt stuff out and slander that's defamation of character when you don't like somebody you slander them you lie about them most of the time is what that is so Paul tells us what to do with them he says let it all be put away from you along with malice all malice so he says let it all be put away take that coat off throw it away those things should not be a part of the Christian's life, along with all malice. Now, you know what malice is. Malice is, is when you do or say something to someone with the intention of hurting them. With the intention of hurting them. 
You know, a lot of times we do things, we hurt people unintentionally. And sometimes we, try, we do things that we're not trying to hurt them, we're actually trying to help them, but it still hurts them. Paul's not talking about that. He's talking about malice when, it, malice is evil. If you have malice in your heart, you have evil in your heart. It's because you want to hurt somebody. And the Christian should never, ever have the motivation to deliberately hurt somebody. I mean, I, I'm against so many things, I don't want to go through the list. I'm against all kinds of walks of life. I've said them to you before. I'd never want to hurt them. Never. That's not Christian. So we should never have malice. Practical holiness is this. This is verse 32. Practical holiness is be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. Now, guys, you put those three things into practice, and here's what's going to happen. If you put kindness to one another, tenderheartedness, this is what you do to people. You're kind. You're tenderhearted. You're forgiving each other. You put those three things into practice, and what you're going to see is most of the conflict that you have in your life, most of the hurt, and when I'm talking about this, is negative emotions. You're going to see most of the anger and most of the bitterness and both, most of just the irritation and the annoying things in your life. Those things that are in your life are going to leave your life. If you're kind, if you're tenderhearted, and if you're forgiving. See, that's the benefits. You're not going to be bitter and anger and wrath and clamor. None of that stuff's going to affect you. Why? You're too busy being kind and tenderhearted and forgiving. And because of time, I'm going to talk about that next week. But I just want to say that If we're not treating people like that, what we're doing is treating people the same way Satan treats them. See, if I'm not being kind to people, if I'm not being tenderhearted to people, if I'm not forgiving people, that means I'm acting more like Satan than I am like God. Because believe me, Satan is not kind to people, he's not tenderhearted to people. And he certainly isn't forgiving people. He's the, he is the deceiver and the accuser of us. He accuses us. I don't want to act, I don't want to act like Satan. And since I've been forgiven, the Bible says, I ought to forgive other people. This is practical holiness. A Christian that does that, a church that does that. It's a very attractive thing to a lost world even. It's an attractive thing to bring in God's children into that church when they see this practical holiness. Would you pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you for this passage of Scripture that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians and and on the subject of practical holiness, where we don't just talk about living for you, we actually do it. We thank you for these five things that you told us and got real specific on it. And God, we know that you want us to live holy and pure and godly lives. And we want that too. I believe the people in this room want to do that as well. Father, we need your help to do it because we're sinners and we sometimes forget to conform ourselves to your word. So, Lord, we ask for your help. We pray in the power of the Holy Spirit that you will help us take the words that we heard today from your scripture, the scripture, apply it to our lives and that you would change us. We pray, God, that when you look at us, and look at this church, that we'll bring a smile to your face knowing that we're serious about our Christianity 
And that we want to live, we don't want to just talk about being Christians. We want to be Christians. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.